Antal and Adam, welcome back to the floor. And you're back, but you're not going to be able to, um, to fill the time as you did uh, before uh, our break. Um, the discussion is out. The floor is yours, and I'm looking to the audience. This is your time to contribute to the discussion. You can ask questions. You can propose um, a daring statements to discuss anything that you could that you would like to bring forward, and I think we have a, a bunch of issues. Silos, silos or no silos? The process, push or pull? How do we make sure that we, as libraries, get to sit next to the researchers and know what they need and what to do? And those are just three of the themes that we could touch on. So. I would say we have until 12 when our lunch starts. Um, I'd like to open the discussion up to the floor. Who would like to start our discussion? Anyone who would like to start? Jim. Uh, yeah, thanks very much for all the presentations. They were, uh, they, they were wonderful and they, and they related. And, and what I'm gonna ask you is to maybe do a little bit of reconciling. So. Um, you know, Adam talked a lot about, about what is essentially data provision for reuse. Um, uh, I mean, I think Ricky talked about what kind of support for data reuse a library might provide. And then Antal talked about, um, you know, the range of activities he has and what he'd like to see people do. Um, it seems to me that providing, providing the, the data is a very different task than providing the support for reusing the data. And what's really a more appropriate um, library role? Anybody? So um, maybe I could make a, one comment. So, so I think this, uh, um, it's an interesting question. There, there's some really interesting parallels between sort of the data environment, um, I think, and and that the, the sort of traditional data center environment in that. I think um, that uh, where libraries have unique digital data, um, they can't count on someone else to provide access to it. Uh, and so it's essential that they provide that role. Um, uh, and support uh, is also essential, but I actually caveat that a little bit. So. Um, um, my sense is, to some extent, like I say, we, we need to not stand, in, not stand in the way of researchers getting access to the data. Uh, we can facilitate it, but um, you know, we don't have to know everything there is to know about it, uh, and we don't have to understand all the detail about uh, the usage patterns. We need to understand them broadly. So um, I think we can, we can facilitate access and support access without doing sort of detailed domain level um, support that you might say, see it, for instance, uh, a subject-oriented data center. I think one of the sort of sobering reminders was th the way we often provide access is by linking a digital object to a metadata record, mm -hmm. thereby essentially duplicating the print world. Um, so that plea for you know data mining, I, we need the text analysis tools, not just the the text was a, a good reminder for us. Mm -hmm. Yes, so I, I think that the data, uh, in, in the textual data, for example, uh, you, you don't know the uses yet. Huh? So, so providing it is very important. Uh, and and uh, who knows what's going to, to happen to them. So the, 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 the National Library was quite surprised to find out that after they re released this uh, there's eight million pages that, that uh, people have found had found uh, tens of ways of usage of this data that they hadn't hadn't thought of. So so the support that they that they, that we required was was basically large bandwidth to access it, and and this version control of course. So so pretty high high demands, but uh, very technical uh, demands. Yep. Mm -hmm. Who would like to comment on that from the tables? Anybody experiencing? Um, has experience right now with providing large amounts of data to researchers or focusing on the report, uh, support instead, using other repositories, so to speak? 
Anybody? Anya? Yes, please. Could you please say your name and, and where yeah. you're from? Andrea Scharnostanz. I would like to make a follow-up comment to, to Ricky's comment. So I'm, I'm wondering if uh, libraries should not be also proactive to actually display their collection in a more tangible way on the internet. So libraries over the last decades have produced opaques, and they are all beautiful. You can today, today go to a library without actually going to a library. But it's at the same time also very different to going to a library and visit the opaque of a library. So if you enter a building, you immediately get an impression how big the collection are. If you are in a small library, or in, if you are in the British library, or in the KB, or somewhere else. And we don't mimic that at all. And I'm, not one, I'm wondering if we don't give something away. So I'm, I'm trying to promote that. It's a bit of my hobby horse to actually get those beautiful overview visualizations, the information visualization specialists do nowadays mostly with networks. And we have an example outside to get that into the collections. And it's very slowly picking up, actually. So I'm, I'm not sure if the librarians are too to shy, to shy, to actually <laughs> think they have valuable stuff in their collection. So or, you really need to know the collection to be able also to find interesting ways. And I'm having a hard time at Dance, where I'm the head of research, to actually promote, uh, so convince my own colleagues to get interfaces into Easy. We did an experiment that's lying somewhere on the web. I think we hardly link to that. But uh, I think there is something there, yeah? And obviously, when the British Library published the photos, you did enough uh, publicity to actually get all those views. And I have seen for the Irish National Library that they had an exhibition with a huge touch table where they displayed their photo collection. I've, I found it very, very amazing. It's probably now five years ago. But do we do that for books? Do you do this for your books, for all your special collections you have in your libraries? Are there maybe examples I'm not aware of? So, so yes, in some sense I would. And I, I also think that there's a challenge that we haven't quite risen to meet, which is providing the services and the access to the data that they would need to do those sorts of visualizations. Um, you know, it, it takes uh, you know, more than an OPAC to build up um, the information that's required to do that sort of analysis. So it requires, you know, your full holdings information um, in digital form that can be analyzed. It requires potentially um, access to the text, um, but also the images. There are lots of ways to give an understanding of the distribution of a collection through the image content as well as the text content. And then, you know, it goes beyond images and text to include uh, cartographic material, audio material, moving image material. And I think um, in some sense the um, I sometimes think that the, the corpus linguistics guys, the tech stuff, is, is pretty sorted out. Um, that's not quite true. <laughs> um, but I, I know um, the image, audio, and moving image is totally not sorted out um, uh, in the same way. It's, it's computationally harder. It's much larger in terms of the storage volumes. Um, and so there's, uh, you know, I think a lot of the action over the next decade is going to be in addressing the sort of non-textual aspects of our collections. But, but I certainly would encourage uh, uh, libraries to, to, to maybe, maybe try out uh, uh, some data visualization projects because some, some data can be visualized really straightforwardly in timelines and without a much curation, without... Uh, so some, some data, is, is you have to be careful, you have to curate it before you can visual, visualize it, but much, much, uh, so browsing, uh, uh, searching and browsing in, in, in collections can be helped by visualizations, uh, that's, that's well known. So. And I don't see libraries do that, that too much. And we, we also, as, as, uh, as researchers, have to reinvent the wheel all the time once we get the raw data and we have to build these timeline visualizations ourselves all the time. So, so this could be a place for the, for the libraries to... Uh... I see the, the, the lady from Dance nodding, but of course we are very curious to see if there's any response from the librarians. Come on. <laughs> could I, could I just we? add one more point to that? Sure. Yeah? Because my, my archivists at home yeah, in Dance, they also think in terms of uh, making, giving really access to the data. 
and then you run in all kind of different problems. So maybe you should more think in terms of what Wikipedia does. They publish dumps. So why not publish a good kind of sorted out dump of your mark record file or whatever comes out of your, of your OPA kind of system. You don't have to publish all the fields, just some of them, and set that out as a visualization challenge to people to play around with. Yeah, so then you have much more control about what you are going to publish and it's much less effort than actually to, to kind of make every little bit of your information retrievable for machines. And that starts to point to a linked data approach where you, you know, find the elements that need but to be made accessible. Ricky, you could just make it up available and share that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I, I will say that OCLC has made um, uh, a good portion of WorldCat available as linked data, and we would love to see, um, we would love to see scholars and others use that data in visualization. We're doing that on behalf of the library community, so mm -hmm. your research. Point your researchers, tell, tell your researchers to, to use WorldCat link data. Okay, good. Microphone, or. I'm uh, Renze Brandsma from the University Library of uh, University of Amsterdam. I think, uh, well, uh, WorldCat is uh, linked to open data, but we can also think about the research output, and there you see that uh, in, in visualizing the, the research output for, from our university can be put in linked open data, especially in the FIVO experiment. And that's something we work on, to, to visualize uh, research and research output and uh, the network of research in, in the FIVO experiment. I think that's an, one of the examples we are doing, um, more than on, on looking at uh, OPAC or something like that. And what audience do you have in mind for that? Um, what audience do you have in mind for that? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, the audience, what well, we're talking with researchers now, what they want, uh, and because that's, it's, the, the audience of the research information system is more the management uh, level, but the, in the FIFO, uh, that's more displaying their research. So we want to know what they are, they, they, they are, uh, they like and what the, they like about is displaying. So I'm not, uh, we, we are in this process yet. I can't tell what, what they like. Right. Well, I'm asking, of course, because we, you know, we heard the example from Adam who says, we put out our images in Flickr. Um, and Antal makes it very clear that researchers need version control. So there's different um, things to focus on for different audiences. But first, let me go to um, across the pond. <laughs> Steve Gass from MIT. Uh, I have a different angle, different question. Yesterday, Ricky presented um, the report, the evolving scholarly record. And at the end of that report, um, it has issues to think about. Um, and I'd like to ask particularly Adam and Antel their reaction to the first um, thing we we're asked to think about in that report, which is drawing a distinction between the scholarly record and the cultural record and whether that really is something we should be concentrating on or if that's a more meaningless issue given the um, type of work you've been uh, talking about today. So who would like to go first? <laughs> So, so to me, the, the distinction is not, is not obvious uh, and usually not so useful. So we, we study, um, well, we help studying uh, historical uh, resources, uh, texts that are either, either written by scholars or, or by uh, eyewitnesses or, uh, or journalists. And, and uh, those are all categories of, of people who, who document things. And, uh, in a way, there's, there's no clear boundary between them. The, they all refer to the same events, basically, and uh, that's why we consider all of them and link them. <coughs> um, so so there's no, it, I hope that, that partly answers your question. Yeah. I, I can say that I agree with that, and one thing I might add is, is sometimes, you know, when dealing with the scholarly record, um, greater precision is quite useful. So greater precision in the linking between, for instance, a published article and the data set that underlies it, 
for things like the versioning aspect, uh, we probably don't want to version the cultural record in the way that we might want to um, version components of it that are used in a specific way for a research task, right? So if, for instance, no one had done any research based on the OCR text of the Dutch newspaper corpus, precise versioning of it would be less useful mm. um, because the versioning is a result of things like improving the quality of the OCR, mm. right? Um, but once it's been used effectively as part of the, the scholarly record, then you want that additional precision. You want to be able to mm. you know, make results precisely reproducible, for instance, um, and that requires a versioning of the, the textual element. So um, you know, I think there, there are many distinctions that can be made, um, but uh, um, I think a lot of them will end up being in that category of, of greater precision um, and perhaps more targeted resources. Well, there is there is literally uh, retrospective versioning. If you if you do literary studies and you go into uh, texts that have been written and uh, transcribed by by scribes, uh, which is so so this used to be called st stematology. So the, the 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 family tree of texts, which is basically a version version uh, control in the, in the medi medieval times and, and and so 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 actually uh, a lot of the a lot of the data that we that we study is actually sort of. Uh, uh, are, so are already versions of, uh, of texts that have been, uh, of which the changes are actually known or, or unknown. And it's, it's part of the study. Uh, and so in that respect, the, 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 the ground material and the, 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 the research stuff that we build on top of it uh, is very much alike in, in lots of ways. My name is Jan Molendijk, I'm with Utrecht University Library. Um, I have a question for, um, uh, for Antal. Um, you mentioned that about 15% of the, of the total Dutch printed uh, heritage has, has been uh, digitized by now, full text digitized, accessible. Um, if you're looking at linguistic research and, and the uh, statistical approach, then 15% is already you know, quite a lot. Uh, and, and statistically, it, it doesn't really make a, a huge difference if that increases to 20% or 25%. What, what would be uh, the real benefits of going nearer to 100%? Oh, this is, a lot, this is the long tail story. So, so in fact, it does make a lot of sense to scan, to have more, because more data means that you see more words that you have, have never seen before, uh, and you see more of the words that you have already seen. And this, this effect persists. So, uh, so you, when you buy a dictionary of, of the Dutch language, it contains 200,000 words. In our, in our collection, we, we have seen, by now, we have seen over 20 million Dutch words, regular Dutch words, including spelling uh, uh, changes that have been uh, made in the, in the course of time. And this, this uh, number only increases. And then, then, then I'm talking only about words. So any new text will add information on new people that are mentioned in the text, new places, new concepts. Uh, and this effect persists. It never ends. So yes, more so, is better. So you have more, more <laughs> events and more names and more places. But that, um, if, if, um, if you're looking at uh, the linguistic aspect of it, uh, as, as in you know, uh, structure of language and, and, and things like that, um, surely that, that effect diminishes. No, it doesn't. No, really. Uh, again, it, 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 uh, it persists. So, so there are these rare uh, occurrences. So language is also a long tail phenomenon. Uh, so, uh, uh, in, uh, only talking about words, 90% uh, of what we say is just uh, reusing uh, small function words like de and, and uh, ik and, and i and de and of. Uh, but then there's an endless tale of uh, longer and longer function wo uh, content words that uh, express uh, semantics and refer to things in the real world. And uh, uh, again, if you, if you study, if you are a linguist, you're actually interested in the long tail, uh, usually. Linguists are, are interested in finding uh, odd, uh, oddball occurrences of, of uh, exceptions, maybe that, that disprove the rule or prove, uh, prove so, some theory that uh, things can, can and, and indeed sometimes do exist, and some, some things don't. It's, um, no, it, it, actually, it's, it's really the, the more data, the better. Yeah. No. So what digitizing uh, projects are going on at the moment? Anybody involved in a really large-scale digitization project at this time? Or is just Google doing that? 
<laughs> or Microsoft we heard this morning. Who would like to comment on this? Uh, Zina Savovic from the Welcome Library. Uh, we have just about started a, a large-scale collaborative project with um, RLUK. Um, have shortlisted uh, a number of partner libraries in the UK to digitize 19th century medical books and pamphlets. Uh, so the, the project is still in the preparation stage, uh, scanning to start in September this year and to be completed uh, by spring 2016. At the end of it, we expect to have digitized about 10 million pages of text. Another strand of the project is really the discovery and text mining and all those aspects because just recreating books in the digital format is not going to be particularly useful. So all I can say at this point is watch this space. We will be regularly communicating about the progress of, of the project. Are researchers involved in your project? Uh, yes, yet? We, we have the academic advisory group uh, and in particular, we want their input in terms of how they would use the data. Right. Do they know already? Because that's what we heard this morning too. Like, I, I you know. think it, it's going to be a conversation. I'm not sure that either the researchers or we, the librarians, know exactly what we want to, to achieve. But it will have to be a conversation that will hopefully result in something really useful and rich. So Anya's question is about a bit the push model. Eh? Who is involved in big uh, digitization projects um, for research? Um, and so I would like to, to, change it, uh, to change the question and ask um, who is involved in, um, in demand projects from the research side? That researchers come up to you and say, you have a fantastic collection, and I want to do this type of research on your collection. Can you digitize it for me? And I will pay it for my project, research project. <laughs> oh. Well, I mean, it's not like, I mean, exactly that, where it's a huge collection, but we actually are involved. I mean, the, I'm Beate Christensen Dalska from the Royal Library in Denmark, and we are uh, involved in two user driven uh, digitization projects. Uh, one is about our books. So we have digitization on demand. So whenever um, uh, one of our users, request a book which normally can only be used in the reading room, um, they can actually, I mean, we will uh, offer them to digitize it. So that gives us, I mean, uh, well, we had an estimate of 5,000 books this year, and we'll reach that by month 10, so we have to find additional funding for it. So it's pretty popular. And these are all out of copyright books, so we are not even pushing up towards uh, the modern time. And we have another project which we do actually not together with the uh, sort of classical research, but that's uh, the vocational schools. There are a lot of uh, journals for uh, sort of, I mean, nurses, school teachers, etc. Uh, so the profession, I mean, profession schools, I think you call them, uh, where we actually will digitize uh, uh, 100 journals, which uh, they will actually uh, request. And uh, I mean, the interesting thing there is that we also have to find out the business model because I mean, these are all in copyright, which means we will have to pay to put them online. So we'll have to experiment with different kind of models for how to actually be able to pay for this. Uh, and I mean, they have, I mean, shared some indication that they actually would be prepared to pay for some of it at least. So, I mean, there would be a, about a half a million pages. So it's not, nothing like the 10 million pages but this is something which, I mean, had it been English, probably it would have been in the store. But because it's Danish language, uh, we have to do it ourselves. Hmm. Any other examples that you would like to bring forward? How? So I, I just wanted I to comment. I, I think um, uh, there are probably many, many, um, and I know, you know the British Library is involved in a bunch of quite you know, what's called the medium to large scale digitization projects. And I think many of the institutions represented here probably are, they're just not leaping up and saying, oh, I'm doing this one. So we shouldn't, um, in this case, take not a lot of voices 
to mean not a lot of activity. Um, I think there actually is a, a huge amount of activity in the area. How's that for the libraries who are here who have not maybe such a huge audience nearby like the university libraries, you know, on campus? How's that for, for those libraries? How do you get the conversation uh, going on with researchers and uh, to see what you uh, want to do or need to do? I know the ISS is here. There might be other, other libraries here who have a different, from a different type. Any comment? Hi, I'm Avalon Duk from the International Institute for, of Social History. Um, I have answers to some questions that were asked earlier. So we do have digitization projects. We are still busy with a digitization project that will digitize 170 meters of our collection. I don't know how many documents that will entail. I think millions. We probably reached a couple of millions already. Uh, but um, not all of them are full text uh, searchable. I think um, most of them are not because it's handwriting or different scripts. Mm. So it's very difficult even you know, to begin to uh, do something with character recognition. And I heard Antal saying something about if you're not in the full text search, you're not in it. So that's my first um, well, comment or question, because uh, those are important collections, but they are not uh, maybe reachable for a machine-readable um, software or tools. And what was the other question? Oh, yeah, about how to uh, connect with your research uh, stuff. Well, we are uh, still working on that. Uh, it has always been... <laughs> Uh, separately in the institute we have a collection department and a research department and there was not a lot of communication between them and uh, also of course in our institute also the question on um, securing and ensuring access to the data sets they, the researchers make uh, is a big question so we are in full discussion with them also about version control which is very important as I'm saying and how to uh, be able to track all versions that are released with articles or uh, in research projects and how to uh, trace them back to sort of the uh, what you call the, 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 the mother of the database, like the big database where it's all come from, how to secure all the different stages in the, in the research, the life cycle of the data set. So. Antal, would you like to comment? No, well, maybe about the, right, the, the handwritten uh, documents, of course. Yeah, there's, there's tons of that uh, available. And I think um, the, there's a lot of energy invested in crowdsourcing um, tools for that. So there's a lot of volunteers uh, out there who are very willing to uh, transcribe, uh, like, say, written birth uh, certi certificates and marriage and death uh, certificates and things like that because they have a genealogical interest, for example. There's, there's Im immense numbers of people doing that. Uh, Voluntarily, and uh, I, I know. Well, I try to follow the the character recognition uh, developments, automatic character recognition. It, it's improving. So there's a, for example, a professor in Groningen in the Netherlands who is uh, who has developed this uh, partially uh, crowdsourced, uh, partially automatic method, where people uh, actually annotate, uh, like you, you know, the recapture. Uh, uh, Control where, where actually you see two images. One is the one is a, a manipulated image of, of a number of uh, letters created by the machine, where the machine knows what is there to, to check whether you are human. And the other one is actually a piece of OCR that that needs to be uh, OCR'd. Uh, so so in fact they do a massive crowdsourcing by people wanting to get access to uh, to, to websites simply by offering them a little bit of uh, OCR resolution. And uh, so you can you can actually uh, include the computer in that so that the computer actually zooms in on things that are important to to uh, to index. So like uh, proper names and uh, times and, and the numbers in in, in uh, what is otherwise text. So so actually zoom in on probably what what needs to be indexed first and then show that to to human annotators who say yes yes or uh, I see these letters here. And I, th I think this this is slowly picking up uh, s s speed and in a number of years we'll be talking about much better uh, quality and much more indexed uh, handwritten material. Right. Is there any comment from the British Library on that? 
I'm not that's good. Okay. Okay, let's go to the audience. Susan. I'm really interested in the, the crowdsourcing aspect um, because I know uh, I work on the Europeana Newspapers Project, which is working on OCR and has achieved pretty good quality. Um, but through that, I learned about Trove in Australia, which has a crowdsourcing project for newspapers, a crowdsourcing OCR project, and it's hugely successful. And I wonder why more libraries haven't used OCR uh, um, crowdsourcing for things like OCR. I, I can't understand why we haven't been more open about it. Maybe people in the room, maybe Adam can, can throw some light on it. And also just to clarify, are researchers happy to trust crowdsourced material? So maybe I'll, I'll make two comments about that. So um, we've done a, a modest amount of crowdsourcing. Uh, we haven't done it for transcription so much. Uh, we've, for instance, done quite a bit of geo crowdsourced georeferencing of our cartographic collection, um, which has been, uh, um, I think, re reassuringly successful and accurate in terms of the results that have come out of it, and so, in fact, turn out to be quite useful for other research purposes. Um, uh, and I, I think there are quality controls that can be built into the process to address many of those concerns. Not always are, but, but they can be. Um, the second is the the, with respect to newspapers, there are a couple of things there. So, so one is scale. Um, uh, I think the, the re so extensive but relatively limited scale of the Australian newspaper collection um, uh, makes it feel like there's a tunnel and it could have a light at the end. Um, and I think sometimes, uh, from our perspective at least, we have, I don't know, let's say 450 million pages of newspaper. Um, that's a lot. And it would take quite a long time using a crowdsourced approach. Um, uh, and furthermore, for English, um, and I, it's different with different languages and different texts, the, the OCR quality is um, not so terrible. Um, it you know, could be much better, certainly, but it's not so very, very terrible. But another factor that's quite important uh, for us is that a lot of our newspaper digitization has been done in the context of public-private partnerships. Um, and so that results in a certain kind of uh, restriction of the access um, which might play, interact poorly with crowdsourced um, transcription or, or correction of the OCR. Um, so that's part, a little bit, I think, I think the, the, there's a couple of the reasons that we've done a bit less of that, so relatively good quality together with some complications around licensing and service and commercial relationships. Any other comments to that? Anybody doing it? Please. I was going to change the subject. Okay. Is that okay? Oh, yes, of course. If you, if you, you well, yeah, sure. So, so in, in the in university research, uh, we were already used for forever to uh, use uh, the student population for annotation, right? So, uh, any standard uh, annotation project or, or psychological experiment involves the student population. So, we're we're sort of used to uh, to uh, using um, uh, annotators that are not uh, uh, precise and not expert. Uh, and so uh, we have done a lot of crowdsourcing experiments uh, without any hesitation. Um, and, and you can see uh, social media as a, as a big uh, distant supervision, uh, as it is called, uh, experiment. So where people use hashtags, for example, to actually really annotate uh, their, their data themselves. And so we've been do doing studies on detecting sarcasm by training on people uh, putting hashtag sarcasm uh, at the end of their, their, their tweet. And we get we get like 400,000 examples of that to train on. Uh, so we, we now have a sarcasm detector. It's not, it's not perfect, but... And, um, so so uh, it's called distant supervision because uh, uh, there are annotators out there who actually don't even know they're annotators. That's, that's the beauty. It's the same with reCAPTCHA and, uh, and, and uh, games with a purpose, uh, basically, so uh, for labeling images and things. So uh, I think there should be, uh, you should have no, no hesitation uh, to, to import that and add that to your existing uh, metadata. Like, like when I bet that in your, your image database, uh, the, 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 so the 150 million 
views uh, have, have generated a lot of, uh, well, some of them have actually taken the trouble to tag the, the image. Yeah, so about 100,000 tagging, something like 100, that. 100,000, okay, so yeah. that, that's, that's minute compared to the views, but, but still 100,000 is a lot. And probably it's, it's, it's roughly useful. Uh, yeah, we're, we're hoping very much to use that some of the taggings as a training to generate training sets for yeah. machine learning algorithms to automatically categorize some of the uh, images. So things like portraits and maps and ships and architectural drawings and so yeah. on. Uh, so so I, would, I would bet uh, I would bet that your your uh, if you you would plot your statistics in in the numbers of views per per image, then this is also a long tail distribution. So and probably most uh, views are with well tagged. Uh, images, uh, um, a small portion of them probably accounts for uh, for most of the, the hits. Um, for, actually, I don't think so, but um, that's for us. Uh, that has mm -hmm. to do more with the way that a viewing mechanism looks. Um, a lot of people will go and start and look at the first 20 pages or so, and we um, don't leave that unchanged. We cycle through mm -hmm. that, and particularly we look at uh, things that haven't been looked at before to make sure they're you're viewed. Things that haven't been tagged will move up to the top. Things that have been tagged a lot also. Oh, so okay, so you manipulate a, that. We're manipulating <laughs> right. the, well, the initial. Still, I. Uh, <clears throat> okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's an indication. I'm looking at the time. Um, uh, we don't want to eat uh, too much into our lunch time, so I'd like to um, ask the the gentleman over there to ask uh, another last question. question. My name is Kenning Arlich I'm from Montana State University. I'm really interested in how we count things, um, specifically website statistics and so forth. So as an example, um, the Association of Research Libraries a few years ago stopped collecting statistics on website visits. And one of the reasons I think that they stopped doing this is because there's no, there doesn't seem to be any real agreement about how to count statistics. So in the last year that they collected those stats, they had, for example, one end of the spectrum, a library that reported 45,000 visits to its website in that year, and the other end of the spectrum, a library that reported 90 million visits. So in that light, I'd, I'd like to ask Adam about the 150 or 160 million visits, uh, views, object views. Image views. How that image views, how those are being collected is it a log analysis software? Is it page analytics software? As you, are you counting all of the images that, are, that create a page, that are, are displayed on a page when they, or is it specifically the digitized object? Um, so, and also, are you filtering out anything? Are you filtering out bots and crawlers and so forth? Um, so uh, the short version is uh, we, um, Flickr has a mechanism in place. Um, they do, uh, um, the, they provide the data and then we kind of um, crawl through the data that they provide to us. Um, and uh, I agree that it's, um, those things are, you know, it's like, what are you counting? Um, that's why we're not counting sessions, we're not counting IP addresses, or the, the thing that seems useful, a, a thing that seems useful to count is how many times has an image been looked at? and then summing that over the set of images. Um, we also count things like tagging events. So we've had about 100,000 tags, tag events, so a tag associated with an object. Um, we have a, a small number of additional metrics that, that we track there. And um, in some sense, uh, I, you know, I actually, I don't think it really matters very much, um, but some things matter a little bit. So, so it's about three orders of magnitude higher than we anticipated. Um, kind of whatever way you were thinking about doing the counting. And uh, that's quite interesting to us. Another aspect is um, if we had installed, if we had done that on our own library infrastructure, uh, it would have totally crushed it, okay? Um, and even the ongoing sustained rate of, I said, somewhere around, to us called 250,000 image views a day, um, uh, last month, maybe it's 300 somewhere in that, in that category, um, that would already quite, you know, stress um, the, the library infrastructure. And so that's, um, those are some of the, you know, qualitative um, aspects of it that I think are, are worth recognizing. And, and certainly the, the opening weekend of, of that particular activity 
there were, I forget the number, but it was, you know, um, many tens of millions in the first week. And if we had done that two weeks before Christmas, you know, using the library's IT infrastructure, we would have been in very serious trouble. <laughs> right? um, and, and those are, again, sort of qualitative measures that are sort of interesting to complement that, um, you know, quantitative measure, which, you know, is, is I, mean, I agree with you, actually, it really is just qualitative. Um, and I, I can't fix um, the way uh, um, web service providers do their statistics and counting. Um, but I, you know, can be thoughtful about the, the way that um, they're reflected. Um, so uh, I think the, the key thing is, you know, much more use than one we ever imagined. Um, uh, I, I, and, um, and much more engagement than we would ever have imagined and that kind of level of, of infrastructure consumption, bandwidth consumption um, was quite, uh, uh, interesting. In fact, the, so Flickr was, has been a lovely partner with that particular uh, partner. We just dumped it on them. We didn't do much partnering, actually. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, and they they dealt with it fine. They're a good, strong, scalable cloud service provider. Um, but their statistics engines actually um, were the things that were stressed the hardest in the first month mm -hmm. or so. So they had quite a bit of trouble keeping up with the counting. Um, sort of they don't provision that as well as their image distribution, which is a good idea, um, but that gave a, another measure of, of how real that um, intense usage was. <laughs> intense usage, that's sort of the answer <laughs> to difficult questions. Ladies and gentlemen, so I'd like to, to wrap up the discussion in the morning, session one. I would like to thank you all for your participation, your, your thoughts, your contribute you, you can, um, your contributions. I'd like to, uh, to thank the speakers um, for their inspiring um, contributions. Uh, lots to think about. Um, I'm sure we will take um, the conversation into our lunch and take the conversation back home between libraries, um, support organizations, researchers to, um, to be along on our journey. Thank you very much.